Okay, this video is what is the cause of cancer? And the reason for this video, I was asked by some viewers to make a video more concise about cancer. It's not easy for me to be concise because I want to make sure people get their main point. Um, but here's, here's a couple key points to really have the building blocks to understand the most important things about cancer. There's two main categories of cells. One is called prokaryote. Pro means pre, and karyote means nut like in Greek, so pre-nucleus. And this is what all students are taught in college, high school, and med school biology, all right? And they tell me eukaryote, eu means true, eu, like true in Greek, karyote, true nut, has a true nucleus. But that is not the main point. The, what you really actually need to know, and this a lot of times doesn't even get mentioned, is the eukaryote cell has mitochondria. Mitochondria is what it's all about. Mitochondria produces literally for a... Uh, glucose molecule to be burned by anaerobic metabolism, you get two ATP. When you burn it through a mitochondria, you get anywhere from 30 to 38 ATP. And that's a ton of energy. That's what makes life on Earth possible for multicellular organisms. So basically, what's the point of all this? This is a secret of cancer. When this mitochondria is damaged, most commonly due to a lack of oxygen, but it can also be rarely due to some toxins and stuff. That's, but the key thing is a lack of oxygen. Once it loses oxygen and the mitochondria are damaged, that human cell, eukaryote cells, or all, all our cells are eukaryote cells, become like a anaerobic bacteria. That is the transformation that determines cancer. Okay, now here's a picture of a normal human cell. It'll take glucose, run it through glycolysis to make pyruvate. Pyruvate goes into the mitochondrial matrix and runs through Krebs cycle and then it goes to oxidative phosphorylation along the mitochondrial membrane makes tons of ATP 30 to 38 ATP alright anaerobic bacteria we talked about it glucose goes through glycolysis anaerobic to pyruvate gets converted to lactate okay and that can be expelled then from the cell okay now when this mitochondria is damaged now the human cell turns into a cancer cell because it has damaged mitochondria and it starts to run glucose just to pyruvate anaerobically and then it'll expel the lactate into the extracellular matrix making it acidic the tumor milieu tends to be acidic and that favors the cancer cell over the surrounding cells the cancer cell will also take the most abundant amino acid glutamine and first it gets metabolized into glutamate then it gets pushed into the Krebs cycle which runs in reverse but the point of all this is that it is damage to the mitochondria that causes cancer. So that's what causes cancer, damage to mitochondria. That's an important point. And you need to know that if you want to understand cancer because what you're going to get taught in all the school books is the genetic theory of cancer, which has been refuted. It's BS. It doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And the Genome Atlas project was a failure. It had actually refuted what they were trying to prove. So this is key stuff, all right? Once a cell loses its mitochondria and becomes a cancer cell, it starts to behave like an anaerobic bacteria. A normal cell in our bodies has a job. Like let's say you're a liver cell. A liver cell's job is to maintain blood glucose during fasting, to detoxify uh, chemicals in the blood, to excrete estrogen, to produce bile for digestion of lipids, okay? That's what a liver cell does, to store glycogen, okay? But once it has it doesn't have a mitochondria now it becomes like anaerobic bacteria anaerobic bacteria is like screw you guys i don't have enough oxygen to do any work i'm just going to try to multiply myself and go find a new apartment all right so it's, this is how bacteria live they sit around dormant and then when food becomes available they divide as fast as possible till they sort of hit a pl plateau phase foods running out or oxygen or whatever resources they need are running out and then they sort of die off okay and cancer is like that it just grows as fast as it can it doesn't care about anything it, it's a worthless mess it's like a selfish bacteria that's what cancer is and this is relevant because understanding what cancer is helps you to treat it helps you to prevent it cancer cell has a different need than a normal cell. A normal cell primarily makes energy to do work. A normal cell is a worker. It is a team player. It exists, for example, in the liver or any other organ system to do the job of the liver, in the kidney, to do the job of the kidney. That's why multicellular organisms are so sophisticated because they've got specialized tissue for all the different things they do. Okay, and we talked about what a liver does, a kidney to, you know, filter the blood, for example. So it needs lots of energy. So most of its glucose gets burned to make energy for the cell to do work. 
makes a little bit of a building blocks of biomolecules. All right, but cancer cell is different. Cancer cell doesn't want to work. Cancer cell could give a rat's tail about working. Cancer cell wants to replicate itself. All it wants to do is divide itself into two cells. So it'll take the glutamine, a uh, widespread amino acid that's abundant, and it'll make lots of protein and especially nucleic acid. The rate limiting step for dividing a cell, and that's what cancer does, it keeps replicating until it kills the person. The dividing, the rate limiting step for cell division to replicate is to make these nucleic acids. Because a human cell has 3.3 billion, B as in billion, base pairs of DNA. And so you need to make 6.6 .6 of them, that's doubling of it, to replicate that cell. All right, well that's a ton. 6.6 .6 billion of anything is a lot. All right, so that's why it's such a resource hog. It's going to suck in 100 times as much glucose as other cells. And it's going to suck in tons of glutamine, this amino acid. And then it's going to make all these nucleic acids. They're made from beginning building blocks with glucose and with amino acids. They need the nitrogen for the nitrogen bases and the nucleic acids. Okay. Now here is what happens with diabetes and high blood pressure. First of all, here's a normal capillary. These are the red blood cells passing through the normal capillary. There's the arrow to show their direction of passage. These little spindle-shaped shells with the nuclei here are the endothelial cells. And the yellow stuff is the capillary basement membrane. So the oxygen diffuses off of the hemoglobin from the red blood cells and goes to the tissue. Right? In this case, it's a neuron in the brain, but these little blue circles are the oxygen going to the tissues. That's normal. Now down here below is diabetes and hypertension. Over time, the capillary basement membrane becomes quite thick. And that leads to less blue circles, less oxygen getting delivered to the tissue. So this is contributing to hypoxia. Hypoxia, hypo means decreased, oxia means oxygen. So hypoxia means decreased oxygen delivery to tissues. And as we spoke about a moment ago, the mitochondria runs on oxygen. So if you don't have oxygen, that will damage the mitochondria. You know, a transient brief decrease in oxygen, the mitochondria can handle that. But multiple hours of lack of oxygen, you can damage these mitochondria. Okay, so what I really want to show you is there's some infections and there's some toxins that increase the risk of cancer. But here's the key point. This guy, Otto Warburg, you know, he's the guy who really made the most important discovery in all of cancer research. What he figured out was if you take cells and you put them in a Petri dish, and then you deprive them of oxygen by 35% or more. And just for, you know, hours, okay? Um, those cells will either die or they'll transform into cancer. And, um, and here's the quote from Otto Warburg. Cancer has countless secondary causes. That's why you hear this is can carcinogenic, this is carcinogenic, this is carcinogenic. But that's not really the main point. The main point is there's only one major cause of cancer. And that is hypoxia a lack of oxygen damaging the mitochondria. There's rare other things that will damage the mitochondria, but that's the most important point to get. Hypoxia is the most common reason to damage the mitochondria. All right, cancer grows in oxygen-deprived tissue, deprive a cell of 35% of its oxygen, and it may become cancerous, Otto Warburg. So the mitochondria is most commonly damaged by hypoxia, and then other things can damage it too, but it's especially hypoxia. Now here's the three phases of cancer. You really need to know this. Initiation is that initial injury, that initial damage of the mitochondria. And everybody's got damaged mitochondria. The human immune system is pretty good at clearing those cells from our body. But the next problem is sometimes those damaged cells will sit around dormant. And then there are things that are tumor promoters. And this is a really big deal. Things that promote tumors can make that cancer grow. That previously was dormant could now start growing. So the smart move is avoid things that promote tumors that make cancer grow. Because once the cancer gets big enough, it'll spread to other locations. It actually does that much earlier than people realize. And that's what tends to kill the patient. Over 90% of the time why they die is because of metastatic spread to an important area like to the brain or to the lungs, for example, or to the liver. Anyways, cancer growth is promoted by animal protein. Yeah, that's meat. That's also dairy. Anything that comes from an animal. Elevated insulin. High fat diets. Elevated estrogen, the hormonal effect on cancers. Iron overload, increased oxidative stress, increased mutations. These are all things that end up promoting tumors. So that's why a cancer patient and somebody who wants to prevent cancer should not eat anything from an animal. That's why it's better to eat a low-fat diet. 
Uh, I actually, when I say low fat, I actually recommend a very low fat diet. You know, trying to keep uh, amount of dietary fat 10% or less. I actually like to keep mine significantly lower than that. Um, avoid things that elevate estrogen. That's all the stuff like get a water filter. Avoid uh, cosmetics and chemicals that you don't have to use. Iron overload. You know, again, don't eat meat. Don't eat iron fortified foods. Don't eat uh, vitamins with iron in them. Those are all things important for preventing cancer. All right. Now here's what happens. The cell, in a sense, has lost its electrical power. And once it's lost its main source of energy, the mitochondria is like, like electricity for a modern building. Then what happens is it, it, the mitochondria sends an emergency distress message to the nucleus. Hey, I don't got any oxygen. I can't make energy. You better come up with a new source of energy from anaerobic metabolism or we're going to die. Okay, we're going to go into what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. So the nucleus then, if it's going to survive, it'll say, hey, it might say, hey, it's too late. We're already screwed. Let's just go into apoptosis. That's recycling of the cells. So the biomolecules within it can be reused rather than frank necrosis means to die outright where the plasma membrane lyses and the chemicals of the cell, the biomolecules are dispersed out into the extracellular matrix, creates a big inflammatory mess that's damaging to the, to the human body. So it tries to go into apoptosis if it can have enough time to recycle itself, so to speak. So it'll be reabsorbed and its biomolecules can be used elsewhere. So anyways, here's what happens in a cancer cell. The message to the nucleus is, okay, we don't got enough energy, turn up the backup generator. And the backup generator, in a sense, is a response of the cell to make more of this particular enzyme. HK2 stands for hexokinase 2. Hexo means six, because there's six carbons in glucose. Kinase means to add a phosphate, because you're going to phosphorylate it. Here's the glucose, and it gets phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate, and then you can run glycolysis. Um, not only does the cell make more of this enzyme, hexokinase 2, so it makes so much of it that it's like a vacuum in the cancer cell, sucking glucose in. A uh, cancer cell uses about 100 times as much glucose as a regular cell. It will then attach to VDEC, a voltage-dependent anion channel, which is just on the surface of the um, mitochondria, the outer mitochondrial membrane. And what's happening here is this fixation to the mitochondria and to VDAC will prevent, it blocks the apoptosis pathway. This Bax protein is what sort of initiates the whole cascade of programmed cell death, apoptosis it's called. Apoptosis is like the fall off. All right, so what I'm saying is this is the key thing happening. This happens in virtually all cancer cells. This is what you need to know. HK2 takes over and becomes like a vacuum sucking glucose into that cell and blocking it from undergoing apoptosis. This is a backup vestigial atavistic primitive whatever you want to call it pathway of anaerobic metabolism that cancer cells do so it's not some random mutation all this somatic mutation theory is bogus nonsense it's not some random mutation it is a specific change to a different type of metabolism and it involves multiple steps it's not just one thing um HK2 is made. That's a change in gene transcription. So some people sometimes call this epigenetic mechanism of cancer. Well, it's a change in gene transcription, meaning a new protein is made from the DNA. And it doesn't just do one thing. It increases glycolysis by its large amounts. Um, it also blocks apoptosis, like I said, attaching to VDAC on the mitochondrial membrane. It also you know, selectively, purposely locates itself on the mitochondria because the mitochondria will still, there'll still be some that make ATP. Not much, but there's a little bit of ATP coming off a of Krebs cycle. Some of them have a little bit of oxidative phosphorylation. Not much. You know, typically you're making 90% of your ATP from mitochondria. It might only be 5% in a cancer cell. But the HK2 puts itself right in the mitochondria, suck whatever little ATP does come off, so it gets first dibs on it to phosphorylate this glucose. So what I'm saying is the cancer cell is no longer a worker doing a job like a good organ system cell in the human body. It's a selfish bacteria, a bad bacteria that just wants to grow for itself. It's going to take energy and steal it from anywhere it can get it. And uh, this is the key pattern of events that happens in the vast majority of cancer cells, if not all of them. And that's the key thing to know. Okay, It comes from this paper right here. It's a nice paper by this guy here, Jing Shen. <clears throat> okay, so now just one quick point about stacking red blood cells together. Red blood cells are about 7 microns. Capillary is a little smaller, about 5 microns in diameter. So they have to deform themselves to go through. 
Uh, high fat diet will increase LDL cholesterol. It's a bridging molecule, sticks the red blood cells together, overcomes their zeta potential. I made whole lectures on atherosclerosis, so you can watch those if you like. I'm just making the point. High fat diet will cause the red blood cells to stick together, and then it's harder for them to get through the capillaries. That creates a blood sludge. And this slowing down of the blood passing through the capillaries will decrease the rate of oxygen delivery to the tissues by about 15 to 20%. So that's contributing to hypoxia. And then if you have a baseline thickened membrane along this capillary because of diabetes and hypertension, then you're gonna further decrease that oxygen delivery. And a hypoxic environment or a hypoxic tumor milieu will favor the cancer over the surrounding cell. So it can both initiate cancer and it can create a more favorable tumor milieu, tumor microenvironment for the cancer to grow. Here's an example of uh, the effect of high fat diets on decreasing oxygen delivery to tissues. This guy, Peter Quo, was a cardiologist in Pennsylvania, took a bunch of patients with known cardiac angina, known episodes of chest pain <laughs> on exertion, all right? Back in those days, there was no IRB. You could do whatever you want for a research project. And then he checked their blood lipids in their arm every 30 minutes. At peak lipemia, maximum fat in the blood, which is about five, six hours after eating a high fat meal with a lot of saturated fat in particular. So they're pretty high in lipids between about four to seven hours. And that's right when they would get chest pain. They would get chest pain right when they're peak lipemia, you know, corresponding to their blood lipid levels. And then what he found out, they later tried, and it was actually another group, Meyer Friedman with Ray Rosenman, they then tried it with uh, omega-6 cooking oils, like all the vegetable oils that became popular in the 1960s um, as an effort to get away from the sat fat, you know, shown to be bad in the 1950s and whatnot by Ansel Keys. But guess what? The omega-6 uh, cooking oils were worse. They pro produce an even more prolonged, oh, I wrote it right here, unsaturated fat oil, this red curve. And they kept the blood sludge thick with hypooxygenation of the tissues so much longer than did the sat fat that the workers said, hey, you know what? We started this thing in the morning. We got to go home. We got a life, okay? We don't get paid enough for this. So the point I'm making is, <laughs> you're, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. You know, fat is bad, all right? You're screwed with the, screwed with the poof of polyunsaturated fat, screwed with the sat fat. It's not good. All right, and then now comes up, well, what about asbestosis? How can you explain hypoxia with something like asbestosis? Simple. Asbestosis inhaled into the lung inadvertently, uh, an inflammatory response forms around it, inflammation progresses to fibrosis, which means scar tissue, you know, like collagen, and that makes it like a, almost like a cocoon around this thing, and then basically the fibrosis causes a lack of oxygen to the inflammatory cells in there. Some of them are stem cell-like for wound healing, and the baseline lung cells, and guess what? Some of those are now hypoxic, can transform into cancer. So you're going to see that Inflammation causes hypoxia. Infections cause hypoxia. This is a mechanism by which they can lead to cancer. And this is what is meant by primary versus secondary causes of cancer. So the primary cause of cancer is the hypoxia. And all these secondary things can lead to cancer indirectly because they're causing hypoxia. And that's why you don't want hypoxia, okay? Lack of oxygen to your tissues. And how do you avoid that? Low fat, low sodium, uh, whole food, plant-based diet. The low sodium uh, recommendation is because sodium is a vasoconstrictor meaning that it narrows arteries so it decreases oxygen delivery to tissues. So now this is just showing how this pattern repeats itself all over the body. You got a typical normal happy healthy liver, person needs way too much fat, they get a fatty liver. NAFL is non-alcohol fatty liver, it can produce a NASH, non-alcohol steatohepatitis, so steato meaning fat, hepatitis meaning inflammation. So that will then progress to fibrosis. So what am I basically saying? A high fat diet causes fatty liver and it can then progress to liver fibrosis and that can progress to full-blown diffuse fibrosis of the liver called cirrhosis, which will have these nodular bumps on the outer surface of the liver typically, creating all kinds of hypoxic tissue in the liver, which will progress to cancer, hepatocellular cancer is typically called, patient dies. All right, so what's the point? Don't let this happen. And I can tell you, fatty liver is so common. When I look at a kidney ultrasound, I'll routinely see a fatty liver. When I look at an abdominal CAT scan, I'll routinely see a fatty liver. It's so common, it's not even funny. Uh, from what I've seen, off the top of my head, I don't know the exact percentage, but in my experience, it's more than half of Americans over 50 years of age have a fatty liver, okay? They're all heading down this path because most Americans eat a, a sad diet, standard American diet. So 
Yeah, on the one hand, you're screwed from the animal protein being a cancer promoter. On the other hand, you're screwed from the fat causing hypoxia all over the place and, and leading to internal damage like a fatty liver as that progresses. And that, that pushes a person through fatty liver, through diabetes, etc. Now, just one quick mention of you'll hear about TGCA was the, genome, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. And basically, it was designed to try to prove the genetic uh, mutation theory of cancer. And it did the opposite. It refuted it. Um, it was already known by the people who really know cancer that it was bogus, but it showed a whole bunch of predominantly random mutations because they're a secondary effect. Once the cell lo loses the energy of the mitochondria, it no longer has the energy to maintain all its DNA repair systems, and it starts getting more mutations. Okay, So that's a secondary effect, and that's why they don't fit any characteristic pattern because they're a secondary random effect uh, predominantly. Okay, Some cancers will have even no mutations. All right, now here's a typical experiment that helps confirm the metabolic theory of cancer. Normal cell divides, and you get two normal cells. Cancer cell divides, you get two cancer cells. However, what they did is they did these cell transfer experiments where, for example, they took the cancer nucleus and put that into a normal cell. When that cell divides, no cancer. So the point is that the cancer is not caused by the DNA, is not caused by the mutations, because you put those, that mutated DNA into a normal cell, it's fine. It just divides, all right? Now, if you take these mitochondria, so this is the cell cytoplasm, the, the fluid in here, the aqueous solution, water-like, and these are the mitochondria, these little things that look like little peanuts, and you put those little peanuts and you give them a normal nucleus, you get cancer. The point being is the cancer is determined by the mitochondria, okay? It is not determined by the, um, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. It is not determined by the uh, the DNA. That's an important point. That's a really important point. That is a confirmation of the metabolic theory of cancer. That is a refutation of the genetic or mutation theory of cancer. Okay, it's a really important point because most people they never can understand much about cancer because they're like, well, I studied the genetic mutation and I still don't get it. It's so complicated. No, it's not that complicated if you study the Warburg effect and the metabolic theory of cancer. Everything will make sense. And there's wonderful good news from that. Once you understand it's largely metabolic, you can do a lot to uh, improve the meta metabolism of your cells so it doesn't get cancer or the cancer is less likely to grow. Okay, here's just, you know, showing this slide again because this is so important. You know, this guy did a great job making this picture here. Um, HK2 gets upregulated. You know, tons more of it is made than under the normal circumstances. So the cancer cell can suck in tons of glucose. And by the way, it's also sucking in glutamine. I showed that in my other picture into here, the amino acid, which is another reason why I'm kind of a believer. Be a little bit on the low side with the protein, okay? Uh, even though, of course, it's animal protein is much worse. That's a topic for another day. I gave a whole bunch of lectures about that separately. Okay, so here's the last slide, and this is the guy who's talking about Otto Warburg, nutrition hero, Nobel Prize winner, perhaps the greatest biochemist of the 1900s. He did all the work on this. You can read the slide if you want, but you already got the main point. Um, other little quick points. You need a good functioning immune system. Uh, 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 just a one uh, centimeter diameter cancer cell can shed like a million cancer cells in the blood. It's your immune system that clears all those cells. So that's why you want to do things to keep your immune system healthy. Get your sleep. You know, exercise a lot, things like that. Get, to get your sunshine for your vitamin D3. Don't take it by mouth. It's better to get it by going out in the sun. Um, eat things like fruits. They're very low in methionine. So, anyways, hope that's helpful.